I'm Kirk Jowers and welcome to the March 26th episode of doTERRA COVID-19 series with Dr. Russell Osgathorpe, the Chief Medical Officer of doTERRA and a board certified pediatric infectious diseases specialist. Now, let's look at today's graphic from the World Health Organization. There are now 462,684 confirmed cases, 20,834 deaths, 199 countries with cases. We're going to look at some graphs that will show you, just in the time we've been doing this series, how much each of these numbers have gone up to give it a little better perspective. That'll be great. Uh, our update for the last three days is that now roughly 2.5 billion, or nearly a third of the world's population, is directly affected by the coronavirus lockdown lockdowns. Uh, specific examples of the transformations that COVID-19 is having on each of us individually, on countries, communities, families, uh, are certainly too many to name, but a couple of noteworthy examples of the seriousness of this pandemic is include that Spain, which has now surpassed China, yep. has transformed an ice rink into a morgue. Uh, other countries, including Brazil, are transforming stadiums into hospitals and other healthcare type facilities. Mm -hmm. The World Health Organization is warning that the U.S. could become the new epicenter of the pandemic as cases soar nationwide. Epidemiologists are predicting that virus deaths in the U.S. could reach their peak in about three weeks. New York City remains the center today of the U.S. outbreak, and cases are doubling every three days in spite of the city's measures to try and combat the spread. As of the filming of this episode, what's happening in New York is really quite unprecedented. Uh, healthcare workers that my colleagues and I have been in contact with are doing heroic things to try and care for that population. I assume just as we've learned something from China and from South Korea that the U.S. will be able to learn quite a bit from from New York, which has the unfortunate uh, They are leading the, the charge. First. Yeah. They're leading the charge right now for us in the United States, and we're going to learn a lot about how they respond to this large wave of patients that they are experiencing in that very densely populated um, city. I'm really glad you're connected with these uh, infectious disease specialists and epidemiologists around the country and even the world because I know that brings a lot back to our home community as well as uh, our, our people here. Thank you for, mm -hmm. for doing that. Uh, the U.S. Senate unanimously approved a massive $2 trillion stimulus package. More work to be done on that, but uh, it sent the stocks at least momentarily in the right directions. Mm -hmm. So, Dr. Osgathorpe, a couple of core questions for you today. Uh, number one, how are symptoms of COVID-19 different from those of a cold, the flu, or even allergies? Great question. So, first off, I want to remind everybody of the triad that goes with COVID-19. Cough, fever, shortness of breath. We right. all know them. We just need to remember them because they're very different from things like allergies. Right now in the United States and in many parts of the world, it's springtime and there's tons of pollen in the air. Right. And people who normally get allergies are experiencing symptoms like watery eyes, runny nose, and sometimes you can even have a scratchy throat with an allergy. Right. But it's the fever that makes the difference. If you have fever, you know you've probably got a viral disease that needs to be looked at. If you don't have a fever and you're a person who normally gets allergies this time of year, it's probably allergies. One question along these lines um, that's been kind of curious to read about, is the loss of smell an indicator of a COVID-19 uh, infection? Interesting question. So um, I'm going to answer that in just a second. First, okay. let me just discuss that the symptoms of COVID-19, aside from the triad, we're seeing other symptoms that have some crossover with regular viral infections like influenza. You can have aches and pains, um, a dry cough, anorexia or loss of appetite. You can have some nausea and even some GI complaints with COVID-19. Um, one of those that, are, that has been in the news recently has been this loss of smell. Right. And there have been reports of folks with COVID-19 saying that I just can't taste my food anymore. Things taste like cardboard. Huh. And it's been linked to potential loss of smell. But we don't know that COVID-19 is the cause of that. It's right now just a linkage. Okay. And so I wouldn't say that loss of smell is a confirmed symptom of COVID-19. It's a suspicious symptom of COVID-19. 
And if you have the triad as well as loss of smell, you should be tested. Does that okay. make sense? That does make sense. Okay. Um, there are a lot of new alleged preventions that people can take for COVID-19. Sure, I've seen um, a lot of those. Yeah. One, for example, is to drink water every 15 minutes in order to wash the virus, as, as the theory goes, into your stomach where it will be wiped out and avoid the parts of the body that can be infected. I don't want to go through all of these, but do you have anything to say as these new theories and, and potential preventions are, are running rampant? I really appreciate the question. Um, to answer that question, I'm going to say that in times like these, we are all searching for things that we can do to take control of what feels like a world that has spun off its axis a little bit. Yeah. Um, so it's natural that people would start talking about things that they think work to decrease the spread of COVID-19. However, be very careful about what you read um, and what you uh, believe. If there were things that we knew based on clinical trials worked to decrease the infectivity of the virus or decrease the likelihood that you would get infected, we would have talked to you about them by now on this program. I'm scrubbing the, <laughs> the web looking at all of the data. There are hundreds of clinical trials on clinicaltrials.gov right now looking at therapeutic agents being used and tested around COVID-19. We don't have data yet on anything other than what we're talking about, which are really tried and true public health techniques of washing your hands, social distancing, six feet apart, right. um, as well as uh, that hand sanitizer, covering your cough, staying at home, quarantining. So when you're sick or you've been exposed to decrease your contact, staying at home, those are the things that we've hit over and over and over again that you need to do, and there's a reason why we do. And right now, I would say that um, look to the CDC, uh, the World Health Organization, and those web pages, and they will detail for you the best evidence uh, right. that is available. We will try and do that here as well. Um, the final question for today is, but if someone works um, in the ER emergency uh -huh. room or they have an essential job that requires them to be around a, lot of, uh, around a lot of people, is it safe for them to be around their children? What precautions can they take? Okay. This is a really important question and one that... I mean, we, you face this a little bit yourself. Absolutely. You're working in a hospital every yeah, day. We, <laughs> we, we talk a lot about this amongst ourselves as doctors and nurses. So I think you need to risk stratify the answer to your question. So there are certain professions that are going to be much more at risk of bringing COVID-19 home to their families than others. Right. Just being in contact with people is not as risky, for example, as caring for someone who has the disease. If you're a healthcare mm -hmm. provider or a family member caring for someone who has COVID-19, you can catch the virus and bring it home to your loved ones. So I, not every profession is created equal, not every exposure is created equal, and so I would ask everyone to kind of use common sense in how they answer those questions about whether your job that you are doing is risky or not. Yeah. Um, Coming into contact with large groups of people, of course, as we try and physically and socially distance, is more risky than if you could just be at home or on a deserted island, for right. example, because the virus is passed person to person. So uh, I think what I would say in terms of how I am mitigating risk in my home, when I am caring for patients, I try and decrease the risk of me bringing the virus home by coming home in a manner that's different than when I come home from work uh, in a non-pandemic time, right. which means that I come home from work, I take off the clothes that I was wearing at work, I shower, and then I greet my family. Right. right. Yeah. Um, that decreases the risk that I'm going to be bringing virus to them. C uh, complicating this, however, is, is that we've learned in the last few weeks about COVID-19 that even before I have symptoms of the virus, I can spread the virus. So viral counts and transmission are high one to two days before symptoms start. And so for close family contacts, that is a risk that our healthcare providers and first responders are taking as they care for each one of us yeah. who has the disease. 
And so we would say to all of them that we appreciate them living and doing the best they can to care for each one of us while also trying to make sure that they decrease the risk for their family members. Amen. Well, thank you, Dr. Osgothor. Thank you, all of our healthcare providers and others who are, who are working so that we can all maintain a, some semblance of our life. And thank you for being with us today.